continues to be my pleasure to introduce to the stage someone who has worked across countless venues to help many people who uh, are in need, from children who need insurance and health care to now focusing her efforts on the end of life, our Compassionate Choices Chief Executive Officer, Kim Callanan. Thank you, Matt. It is really wonderful to be here tonight in Oregon among so many of the pioneers in this movement, including our colleagues at End of Life Choices Oregon. In just 10 days, we will be celebrating the 21st anniversary of the Oregon Death with Dignity Act. Let's give yourselves a round of applause. We have made tremendous progress in the last two decades and we have made unprecedented progress in the last several years. With the authorization of Hawaii, that became the fourth jurisdiction to authorize medical aid in dying in just a four year period. It took a 20 year time span to authorize the previous four states. That is tremendous progress. Thank you all. While our pace for progress has accelerated, it has emboldened our opponents. They are really angry at us. And we feel it every single day. They come at us with legislation, litigation, subpoenas, regulatory roadblocks. And each and every time, we are able to defeat them because of your support. Despite the highly polarized and partisan environment that we are in, I remain incredibly optimistic about the future of the end of life choice movement. We receive widespread support. It doesn't matter what political party you're from. It doesn't matter what religion you're from. People want choice and autonomy at the end of life. As the baby boomers retire, and they begin to take care of their aging parents, and they contemplate their own mortality, our support will only grow. Our support will grow because we are on the right side of history, public policy, popular opinion, and humanity. To capitalize on our momentum, the Compassion and Choices Board of Directors adopted a brand new strategic plan. And in that strategic plan, we put forth a bold objective that within 10 years, half the population in this country would have access to medical aid in dying. Now notice the really important word that I said, which is access. It is not enough to pass a law. People should be able to access that law from their own doctor at their, in their own health system. People should not have to reestablish care during the most vulnerable period in their life. We must remain and ensure that people are able to access the law. Now, medical aid in dying is just a start. What we have seen through the implementation of medical aid in dying is that we are creating a transformation within the healthcare system where the patient is becoming the ultimate decider in their end of life care. And we see this transformation as being similar to the kind of change that you saw in the childbirth movement. When my mother delivered me 50 years ago, she had absolutely no say in what her childbirth experience looked like. She was rushed to the hospital, medication was thrusted upon her, she was strapped down to a bed, and my father was relegated to the waiting room. 30 years later, when I delivered my son, I had an option. I wrote an eight-page birth plan. 
eight pages. My medical team honored that birth plan. I had limited interventions. My husband was by my side each and every moment. That transformation that took place within the childbirth movement is the kind of transformation that we in this room are creating around end of life choice and care. Imagine, and it's not that far in the future, there will be a time when doctors come to you and say, how would you like to die? And you are gonna be able to have that option. Now, medical aid and dying is only the start, though. When the board adopted our new strategic plan, they took on one of the most difficult challenges that we are facing within end-of-life choice and care, and that is the issue of dementia. When I first experienced the issue with dementia, it was about 25 years ago, and it was with my grandmother. My grandmother was a woman who loved children. Not a moment went by where she did not remind me that she was waiting for me to make her a grandmother. <laughs> the time finally came with the birth of my son in about 2000, in the year 2000. Unfortunately, by the time he was born, my grandmother already was in advanced stages of dementia. And I very naively thought that somehow seeing her new grandson was going to snap her out of the trance. And so I came to visit her, and I brought her grandson, and I put him on her arms, and there was nothing. She laid there motionless. She didn't move. She didn't recognize me. She didn't recognize my mother she didn't recognize her husband of 50 years. I was naive then. I somehow thought that I could bring that memory back. The reality was several more years went by and we showed my grandmother love by doing exactly what the vast majority of people do. We treated any illness she got. She got pneumonia, we gave her antibiotics. She ended up getting surgery at one point. That's what love was in our mind. In that moment, that was when I started to contemplate quality of life and the certainty of death. We didn't realize that we were extending my grandmother's life, that we were prolonging her death, we were just caught up on the conveyor belt of automatic health care. That was what people did. Unfortunately, in 20 years, not much has changed. The propensity to treat is so strong that 9 out of 10 people with advanced dementia get some form of an invasive medical treatment in the last month of their life. Nine out of 10 people. We are not just refusing to let people with dementia die. We are doing everything possible to keep them alive. And this is counter to what the vast majority of people say they want. A survey that was done in JAMA showed that the vast majority of people see living with advanced dementia as a fate worse than death. But right now, the conveyor belt of medical treatment puts you in a place where you really have no other options. It doesn't have to be this way. And that's why Compassion and Choices is getting ready to launch our new dementia initiative. Through our dementia in initiative, we are going to help to honor people's wishes if they document them in advance so that they are able to choose to forego treatment or to voluntarily stop eating and drinking. Now this is people's legal rights right now. We don't need to change the law. People are legally allowed to do this right now. But it is not recognized within medical system. It is hard to find doctors that will support you to do that. 
And what ultimately happens to the vast majority of people when they try is they're made to feel as if somehow this is elder abuse. When really what it is, is it's showing your love by honoring and respecting the person's values and priorities. I'm now going to turn it over to the video. And we're going to hear from one of our wonderful, wonderful board members, Jerry Lee Shaw. She has her own personal experience with dementia, and she was so inspired to see us take on this issue that she gave a very generous seed grant to be able to fund the start of this program. And she's going to talk a little bit about the tools that we'll be releasing later this year, or, or later next year. One aspect of the Compassion and Choices Dementia Tools that I highly value is that it helps the person with dementia and the family in the early stages and the later stages. In the early stage of dementia, when a person has their full mental capabilities, they're able to tell you and you can document through the tools their wishes, their choices, what they want and don't want. Too often we focus on the family or the caregiver, but this is really giving control and authority to the person with dementia. I have seen the difference this makes with our family member who has dementia and when we started working through the Dementia Proxy and some of the other tools that are coming available, it was so powerful to watch that person's confidence and spirit toward the future change. We went from despair to hope. The toolkit also gives you a way to manage the later stages where it gets a bit more complicated. It is so often in the later stages of dementia, people receive medical treatment they did not want. A surgery, a DNR is ignored, and the the tools allow the person who is the healthcare proxy, who has the legal authority, and the family to honor the wishes of the person with dementia and to make sure that those are carried out the way the person wants. Now those tools will be developed early next year. But we all know that tools are not enough. Tools are just the first step in empowering somebody to be able to get care that's consistent with their values and priorities. But we ultimately need to change the entire way medicine thinks about end-of-life care and treating people with dementia. And that is going to take integrating our new dementia program into the access campaign and getting doctors and health systems and hospices to fully recognize and appreciate people's legal rights. Six million people live with dementia right now. Absent a miracle cure, that number will grow to 15 million people by 2060. It is time we establish a new cultural norm around dying with dementia where loving want somebody means honoring their values and priorities that they have documented in advance. Giving Oregon's role as the pioneers in this movement, I can think of no better place to launch this program than right here. Speaking of pioneers in the movement, I am now very excited to share that our own Barbara Coons Lee is almost done with her next book. Um, her book is called Finish Strong, and the book is all about empowering people to chart their own end of life journey. She has taken her decades of experience in working in the, both as a nurse and a physician's assistant and then as an advocate. And she has put it into a beautiful book. And for any of you who know Barbara, you know that she has a way with words. It is 300 pages that you will not want to put down because it leaves you feeling as if you can have the kind of empowered end of life experience that you want. When I read the book, I immediately thought to myself, this book has the potential to transform end-of-life choice and care the way our bodies, ourselves, transformed the women's health movement. Now, we have the power in this room to help make that happen. The book is going to be launched on January 8th, 
So you can take your calendars out. I will not be upset that you're looking at your phones and mark January 8th and block the day out so that you can read the book. It is worth it, I promise you. And then after you've blocked the day out so that you can read the book, think about who else do you want to make sure that, read, that reads the book. Share information on, on Facebook, send it to your friends, buy it as presents, host a book club where you can talk about it. It's a great tool for you to talk to your, your relatives and your family members about the kind of care that you want. And it's a great tool that the more people that we get this tool into the hands of, the increased likelihood that we have that we will establish end of life choice as a basic and fundamental civil right. Finally, I wanted to um, recognize one last um, amazing person, and that is Carol Bradfield. Carol Bradfield was a volunteer in Portland, and some of you probably know her. And she very generously gave her time um, to us while she was alive. We were just the recipients of a very, very generous gift from her. And so I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize that very generous legacy gift that she gave to us. Through her gift, we now have some funding to be able to jumpstart our new strategic plan. Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh, no, Carol gave the gift, and now I don't have to, and I really wanted to contribute. But it's, it's really OK, because our street strategic plan is going to cost just a couple of dollars for us to implement. So there is plenty of time for any of you who wants to to be able to give an additional gift. And of course, if you'd like to recognize us the way that Carol did with a legacy gift, we certainly welcome that as well. Um, in closing, I just want to thank you all for being here. This is a movement that has come about, every bit of our progress has come about as a result of your incredible contributions, both monetarily as well as the support that you've given through your time and energy. And with your continued support, that progress will continue. So thank you very much for everything you've done.